um, sexual pain affects almost as much as 20% of women across the world. And that prevalence varies by geographic uh, region, but in the United States it's somewhere between 8 and 20%, depending on who you read. Um, it's been associated with a lot of um, disability, so physical disability, um, sexual dysfunction, um, psychiatric disability, um, and uh, it's been associated with a lot of healthcare costs. So it's a very common uh, and um, uh, expensive and just debilitating kind of condition. The problem is because it's sexual pain, it's something that women don't talk about. So patients often go around um, just suffering in silence, um, which is terrible. And then providers are not very well trained to take care of patients. So there's a mismatch between the need and the actual resources that patients need. As far as how well or uh, poorly it's being managed, I would say for the most part it's poorly managed because uh, providers are, it's not something that we teach healthcare providers to deal with in medical school. Uh, patients are stigmatized. Um, they usually have to go from doctor to doctor to get a proper diagnosis. Um, and if you think about it, there's 43,000 gynecologists in the United States. We have about 14 million women living with this kind of pain. So there's and less than 5% of those gynecologists, actually less than 1% of those gynecologists are trained to take care of these types of gynecologic pain. Um, so there's a huge mismatch in the need. Um, so there's lack of education, lack of resources, and I think one of the saddest things is that we have a lot of treatments available, but women just can't get to the providers that are able to provide them with those types of treatments. To me, a frontline practitioner is anyone who has contact with a female patient, is um, any of any provider that has contact with a female patient is able to screen a patient for genital pain. And it's easy to do, just ask the patient if she's had any kind of discomfort during intercourse or during the physical exam when they have annual pap smears. Um, so screening is the easy part for us. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that chronic genital pain is no different than any other chronic pain in as far as um, psychiatric and psychological comorbidity, um, patients are affected the same way. Uh, we do the same, we do, we use many of the same therapies in our genital pain patients. So for analgesia, we'll use um, your typical analgesics that you use in chronic pain patients, such as tricyclic antidepressants, anticonvulsants. And so you almost, you, any provider can, can, who's familiar with pain can initiate some of those therapies. Um, it's easy to screen a patient because you, if you do a pelvic exam, you want to rule out the, the obvious causes of infection or bleeding or uh, neoplasm. But once you've done that, then you can initiate therapy just to help the patient with her pain. And then one of the most common therapies that we use in these types of patients is pelvic floor physical therapy. And whereas, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't, people didn't even know what a pelvic floor physical therapist was, but nowadays, it's much more common to be able to find a pelvic floor physical therapist to help the patient um, deal with her pain. So analgesia and a pelvic floor physical therapist, I would say, are the first two treatment options that anyone, not even, not just GYNs, can initiate. So in the context of the biopsychosocial model, sexual pain is very similar to other pain syndromes. Um, this type of pain affects patients physically. So um, the, when I, what I mean by that is they can have pain that's severe enough um, that they can't do their daily activities. Um, this type of pain can affect them psychologically. So they can become very distressed, very anxious. Sometimes they become depressed. Um, and all of those things you can address with non-gynecologic therapies. So that, that crosses the spectrum of medicine. Um, and, and I think that what people don't realize is that some therapy and just be able, being able to believe and validate your patient goes a long way um, when compared to doing nothing and just ignoring it. 
And so if you can just initiate therapy and then when you get the chance, get the patient to a specialist, uh, that would be a lot more helpful to our patients than just not screening and not treating. And the last point that I wanna make is it's important to recognize that this type of pain is not a psychological problem. I mean, a lot of people think that conditions like vulvodynia um, come about because the patient is depressed or it's a psychological pain that they're making up or um, another one of my uh, hated <laughs> Uh, things that I hear sometimes is that the patient's just trying to avoid having intercourse. And that's actually not true. When you look at the, the evidence, it shows that most of our patients want to be sexually active, and most of them actually are sexually active in spite of the pain. So I think it stands to reason that it may not, patients may not necessarily be looking for a pain cure as they are for some pain relief and for some social support and for some validation. I think if we can do those things, we'll go a long way.